Welcome, everyone. I'm Eric Martin from Adaptive Change Advisors. And today I'm excited to be in conversation with Dr. Carmen Rojas, who you see on the screen here with me. Uh, Carmen is the CEO and the president of the Margaret Casey Foundation. Um, I think, Carmen, at, we're getting together, what, is it about once every five years to have these conversations? <laughs> right? so, I know. Really so at the, true. It's always at these important inflection points, and it just happens to be that this is a, like a uh, both a professional and a um, moment in history inflection point. But I'm really glad to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this pace, it'll be 2025 before we speak again, but I have a, I have a feeling it'll be before then. Uh, so we, you know, we hope this conversation, and it will be a conversation, will be useful to you, uh, and that perhaps you'll feel inspired and have a new way of communicating what true leadership for racial equity looks like. So we'll be checking the chat box uh, as we go. Please feel free to ask questions. And, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll respond as best as we can. We have about an hour here today. So I wanna just uh, briefly anchor this conversation with a story. And let me put up, a, I have a little screen share here, which I can show briefly. Uh, give me one second. There we go. And I wanna, I wanna cast the anchor far away to one of the special places in my life uh, which is a place called Ladba, India. And an even more special person who you see here on the upper left-hand side named Vimal. Now, Vimal is right now recovering from COVID-19. And when he's not stuck in the house, he is leading a civil rights movement in India for what used to be called the untouchable peoples, otherwise known as a scavenger community. And um, I met Vimal some years ago and really became impressed with his take on leadership. I remember having a conversation as his organization was beginning to professionalize. People were offering money, foundations and others. And he said to me, uh, and he said, Eric, there's not enough money in the world to solve this problem. We're talking about nearly 300 million people who are living in abject poverty and oppression. He said, there's not enough money to solve this kind of problem. And then he smiled in his kind of quizzical way and said, but there are enough people. So we've been working together, Vimal and I, for, for years based on these four beliefs, these four principles that guide our work. And I'll just speak briefly about them and then talk a bit about Carmen. Uh, so the, this basic idea here is that we all have five leadership moments every day. Uh, so it's fascinating if you think about it. Every day you have a choice that you can make. And we'll talk a bit about that on this call, what those choices look like and invite you in a bit of call of action, call to action later on to consider your own leadership moments. But these big changes that we hope to see in our work and our society happen through small leadership moments. And people are always adapting and changing to survive and thrive. So leadership is no longer, and never was really, just the realm of the elite. Uh, and it's about us as individuals making each of our actions matter. So I first met Carmen, let me just take this off the screen here. I first met Carmen about 10 years ago it was a, a heated senior team meeting. Um, I'm sure you recall it well, Carmen, I, I do. It was a, a nonprofit that brought together people with financial capital and ostensibly people who didn't have financial capital. Carmen and I were both in our previous roles. My, I was a leadership consultant. Carmen was someone who had a finger on the pulse of something that few others in that room did and that something had to do with racial equity. 10 years ago, mind you, this wasn't in the air in a very visible way. And it was a moment that called for, uh, screamed for really, someone to exercise leadership. And it wasn't coming from the person at the top or the people at the top. And to ask the hard questions, to have a courageous conversation, to take a stand. But Carmen did, and nobody else did, including me. It was one of my biggest failure moments uh, to exercise leadership, particularly when it comes to racism and racial equity. So uh, Carmen left not too long after that to create an innovative organization, which she might talk about later on. And she's now, as I said, the CEO and the president of the Margaret Casey Foundation, a role where she is already in a very short span of time exercising extraordinary leadership, most recently by announcing a partnership with a sister foundation to support scholars who are imagining and building a different future for all of us. It's called the Freedom Scholars. You can look it up. And more than that, she's de developing leadership in others. Uh, she successfully transitioned leadership at her last organization, hiring and promoting people in the current organization, and has uh, just a wonderful way of giving ownership to people, uh, which I really admire. So as for me, I went on to create ACA, 
which is the premier mission-based organization for adaptive leadership in the world. And our mission is to democratize leadership, which means putting tools that drive consequential change into the hands of anyone who seeks to lead meaningful outcomes, regardless of their identity, history, or access to power and financial capital, as I saw with Vimal in India. And I've come to see leadership as a moment. It's something you do, not something that you are. What is a leadership moment? Uh, it's a moment where you, your heart leaps, uh, maybe with hopeful anticipation or fear of taking the next step. Uh, you've, I'm sure, and we all have experienced these moments in our lives. You know, the time that you called out a, a racist uncle at the Thanksgiving Day table, that was a leadership moment. At the time that you failed or chose not to become complicit in a political rant by one of your Facebook friends, that was maybe a leadership moment. So the people who take a stand on behalf of something bigger than themselves and often pay a price beyond the loss of their own comfort are people who are exercising leadership. And they're often labeled as troublemakers in part because the advocacy that they do comes at the, common, at the cost of someone else's complacency. So Carmen, with all due respect, I think that you are one of the best and most strategic and most caring troublemakers that I know, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm honored today to be beside you for this conversation. So uh, perhaps can you just tell us a bit about your own path as a leader and what it means for leaders to address issues of equity and access in their own organizations? Yeah, so first, thank you. Like what a generous introduction. And um, I feel like one of the things that I've always appreciated about you, Eric, is this ability to look back at yourself in moments in time and um, hold the fact that we can all be better, right? Like every moment is an opportunity to begin again. Uh, and that happens through like a depth of reflection and assessment in oneself. And so thank you for the generous introduction and for, for making space for us to be in conversation in this way. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, my leadership journey is an unorthodox leadership journey. Uh, I, and for all intents and purposes, like an aberration of the American experience. My parents didn't graduate from high school, neither did my siblings. Um, I don't come from a lot of money or access. Um, and I have always been animated by this belief that we as a country owe each other so much more and um, wanted, wanted to fight for that wanted to fight for greater dignity, wanted a great fight for greater opportunity, wanted a fight for greater stability, and fell into a trap that I think a number of leaders of color fall into, which is essentially like replicating white supremacist norms in organizations in order to make my way up. And when we met Eric, I'd kind of reached this uh, breaking point. The way that I describe it now is that maybe from my late teens through, uh, my early 30s, I had trained myself to hem up all of my feelings. Like I had bound my edges of emotion so that white leaders couldn't say that I was too emotional or so that leaders of color and women of color leaders couldn't um, hold my feelings in opposition to my intellect. And so um, when we met, I could start to feel like the seam rip. You know, I could start to feel like the impatience. I could start to feel um, the limiting factor. And more importantly, I started to feel the collateral consequences of replicating white supremacist norms as a leader within institutions that weren't calling for the demo democratization of resources and power. And so um, left an organization that, you know, for all intents and purposes was stable and left in a feeling a very different thing. Up until that moment in my life, I had felt like every decision, and I think this is a common feeling for women and leaders of color, um, every decision feels like you're jumping off of a cliff, right? Like it can, it can make or break you, especially if you are the one person in your family. And when I made the decision to leave, I made a decision personally that the dis that the choices that I made as a leader moving forward were no longer going to be cliff jumps. They were going to be one step in front of the other. It was going to be stepping off of a curb, realizing that like the emotional weight of making these huge leaps, um, the trauma of feeling like if you make a bad decision, it could impact all of these people around you. 
Um, so I just made a choice that that was no longer going to be the case and that I was going to uh, lead uh, in, in a couple of ways that I think are still true today. So first is the animated by servant leadership, realizing that I am not only not the smartest person in the room, but I'm often not the most equipped uh, to solve the problems that are at the forefront of my mind and actually listening to people in communities and handing over almost like in a genuflecting way, uh, power uh, mostly by resourcing, mostly by listening. Um, and so leading as a servant leader, I think is an, a really important thing and a true countervailing force to what we understand leadership to look like both in our politics and our economy today, which is like really like a certain leadership, which leads to the second thing for me, which is leading with curiosity. And this is something that I think it comes from my conversations with you early on, Eric, and the early adaptive leadership training, which is, you know, questions create so much space. Mm -hmm. And there are a million ways to get to the destination of justice that we're trying mm -hmm. to get to. And I want to know those million ways. Um, and I think that there's a way in which we are in, living in a moment of certainty that has hamstrung our imagination of what's possible for us, but also how we're going to get there. The third thing for me is um, something that I actually just recently heard and so resonated with my experience, which is feeling a, a true multi-generational commitment that the things that I may do in my leadership today may not result in anything in my lifetime, but I am committed to surrendering my leadership today in service for the, of the well-being of future generations. And so as I think about sort of my leadership moment today and, and the journey that has gotten me here, it's been really holding these three tenets as true and holding myself accountable. You know, so there's, there are a lot of times <laughs> when I want to be the most certain person in the room and then I have to reflect and, you know, um, call myself back into the person that I know I am capable of being. Um, but I, I, I am really experiencing so much. If when I met you, I was hemmed up today, I feel free. Mm, mm. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to lead in ways that emulate freedom and spaciousness for leaders who don't often get to stretch their arms, who don't often get to breathe into the bottom of their lungs, who don't often um, get to be whole in their work. And we as a society suffer because of that. Yeah. Um, th thanks, Carmen. There, there's so much in, in what you just shared. I, I, I kind of want to go back and unpack these yeah. nuggets. Let me just, I just want to kind of maybe point to a few things that really grabbed my attention as you were talking. And um, and the first one is you, you talked about feeling hemmed up and in that, in that meeting and in, in, in that situation. I, I just wonder, do you remember, I mean, do you, do you recall, maybe not that particular meeting, but a moment, can you bring us back you know, to, to know a exactly place? I we're talking about in that meeting. Yeah. It's like one of those things, the thing about um, experiencing racism, like when racism impacts you or race becomes a way that your intellect is questioned, is that the person who inflicts that pain does never never has to reflect on that moment. It's something that happens passively uh, and in passing. But as the victim, as the person who suffers uh, because of somebody's ignorance, it's something that I feel like I carry at least. I'll speak for myself. Um, and I go back to a moment. So in that conversation, we were talking about whether or not, as a grant-making institution, we were making loans to supermarkets to go into communities, and uh, the loans were no interest. So essentially, it was free money to private businesses to go into places where there were no supermarkets. And I made the suggestion that, okay, we're giving people free money. Can we say you have to hire from the local community? Can we say you have to pay a prevailing wage. Can we say um, some sort of the revenue from the company that we are essentially under, underwriting goes back into the community? And the conversation quickly went to, we can't actually paste those types of strings onto this kind of money. 
And it felt absurd to me because while we were talking about improving the lives of low-income people in cities, the key beneficiary, beneficiary, the people who were most likely to win were people who already had money, people who owned houses and didn't live in the community, people who could have gone to a bank and gotten a loan. Uh, we were not trying to democratize power. We were trying to change place in ways that um, would have a consequence on the lives of people living in those communities. And I remember feeling like, um, I could just, you know, it's so funny how you can remember people and places. I can remember you sitting in, in the corner of this conversation and I was just like, I could feel like I need to say it in a different way, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the, the saying it in the different way. It was, this is where I think democratizing leadership is important. It was yeah. the ability of leaders in that organization to hear it in the way that I was saying yeah. it. And oftentimes, the burden is slanted. We are on a, we're on a seesaw and the person at the bottom of the seesaw um, needs to make, uh, say the same thing in, in many different ways. And the person who's floating in the sky actually has to do very little to change their perspective. Um, yeah, that yeah. was the moment. And that, you know, that um, you also spoke about, and that this is an example of internalized oppression in, in so many ways. And part of that internalized oppression also is it comes with an assumption about what a leader is or what leadership is and what it isn't. Um, you know, the questioning of yourself, it comes, I assume, right, with the questioning, well, can I actually do this? Can I lead? Am I competent? Do I have the answers? But that whole definition, that whole assumption around leaders are people who have answers mm -hmm. actually is not true. I mean, that's, that's actually part of the system of oppression okay. that we, you know, we can't ask the hard questions. We can't create trouble. We can't protest. We can't take a knee unless we have a solution. Yeah. And, and I think that old adage, which I don't agree with, which says, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions is entirely wrong. Okay. That's the old way of leadership. And I, I just wonder, and we'll talk maybe about the foundation now where you sit and, you know, some might say are sitting now in a position of power and resource. Uh, but before we even get to that, I'm curious, and if you could talk a bit about the transition from that moment we talked about between then and now, where you actually have, you did a lot of work, which was very grassroots oriented, uh, working with maybe some of these same communities that you so, so uh, desperately wanted to work with and weren't able to before. Do you, can you just say a little bit about that transition, yeah. how that kind of played into your leadership journey? Yeah, you know, like I, the conversations that we've had, uh, and so for folks who are listening, I feel like um, in these five every five years episodic conversation, I get invited in conversations with Eric to reflect on the places, the types of questions that I'm trying to answer for myself as a leader and the type of justice that I'm trying to seek out in the world, right? And I, I think one of the challenges with coming to people with solutions that we, is that we assume that every question is exactly the same, right? Like we assume that like, um, should this be our payroll benefit versus should this be the leader we invest in are the same kinds of questions and being able to discern between the types of questions and the types of answers that we're looking for is um i think a gift of our relationship eric that i uh, that i covet that i uh, really treasure and so um I left that organization and was given an opportunity to build an organization and um, from the outset decided a couple of things. One, I was going to be, I was going to build an, econo an organization focused on building power for working people that um, actually had the voices and stories of working mm. people that were most inconvenient to us at the center of our mission. So I was less interested in talking to the economist and more interested in talking to the gig worker. I was less interested in talking to the policymaker and more interested in listening to the childcare worker. And so that was sort of um, the orientation of who was allowed to be expert in their experience that helped me sort of tether their mission of our organization with the impact I wanted to see in the world. Internally to the organization, um, I wanted to build an organization that uh, created evidence that leaders of color didn't have to jump off of cliffs in order to progress in their careers, that it didn't have to feel like a bungee jump, that you didn't feel like you had to put everything on the line.
to take a step forward. And so hired a team that was entirely people of color, entirely first generation, overwhelmingly queer, um, to really at at the outset, create evidence that you can have hard conversations and be safe. Um, that wow. you can contest for power and still feel nurtured and seen as a whole person. Um, I also wanted to create a deeply, like, uh, my experience is a very public experience. I went through public K through 12, went to a community college, went to, you know, public college, college and grad school. And there's something about that that's so important. Oftentimes, I think in leadership positions, there are these labels and experiences that we ascribe to um, certain leaders. So you had to have gone to an Ivy League. You had to have interned or clerked for a certain person. I wanted to find people who um, didn't have those experiences, but had proximity to a life that would create a depth of understanding mm. and love for the working people at, at the center of our mission. Um, I wanted to be, what I didn't have was like, I felt like I'd push the hems and they ripped apart. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like gently pull the hems. I'd pull the seams. I wanted to pull the seams. Uh, and I wanted to do it in a gentle way so that people, my team then, and even my team now felt safe, um, in in this new form of leadership right yeah. because if if i act a certain way it's going to be modeled out in the world and i i wanted a deeply democratic a deeply loving and imaginative a curious leadership and so wanted to create not only a workers lab to build power for working people but a people lab that could create evidence of what it looks like when you um adore a team and want yeah. everybody to be successful and I love that way of thinking about leadership. Again, many people might listen to this and say, well, that, you know, that sounds all good and dandy, but that's not leadership. That sounds soft, but, uh, but that's some of the hardest stuff to do. I mean, to hire the team that you hired and for them to step into that space as well. I mean, those are just the, the courage required to do that. And then the courage, as you said, to have those courageous conversations. I, for me, this idea of democratizing leadership is twofold. Uh, first of all, having grown up in the city of Detroit myself during the height of its decline, you know, every day when I walked outside, I, I wondered why doesn't someone do something about this? You could see the decay every day and certainly every summer getting worse and worse. And, and there was, as far as I could tell, people who you know, were good at casting blame on others. And in that case, it was, you know, well, you know, this is you know, the, the black people are doing this, black people are doing that, the black mayor is doing this. It was you know, a lot of that scapegoating and worse, uh, you know, overt racism, which was um, obviously not solving the problem, making it worse. And I just grew frustrated by that. And when I eventually uh, came into this kind of work that I do now and got exposed to some of these frameworks of leadership, which I could say more about later on, I was wondering why don't other people have access to these tools and techniques? It shouldn't just be in the, in the hands of the elite. So part of democratizing leadership is just about making those experiences available to people, those tools. But the other part, which you touched on, I, I wanna ask more about this, is kind of the, it's what Parker Palmer calls the, the heart of democracy, the skill set of democracy, which is holding conflict, which you know, conflict's gonna come anytime we ask these questions and challenge norms and systems, holding that conflict in a creative and life affirming way. Mm. And to me, that's a heart, that's a skill set of democracy that, you know, it's, it's what happens hopefully before and after the ballot, the ballot is cast, right. and yet doesn't enough. And so you talked about these difficult conversations, and I'm wondering, you know, just give us, if you can, just a texture, like what kind of conversations do you see happening in this space of uh, racial equity that give you hope? And maybe what are some of the, you know, the, the traps that you see those conversations falling into? And I'm thinking here of the technical adaptive distinction, yeah, which we might touch on later on, uh, yeah. For me, the, the, I'm gonna start the, the opposite way. The, the confusion, um, confusing representation and, um, uh, and democratizing power. Like there's a way in which the current conversation around rec racial equity is really organized about finding the one finding the one black leader, finding the one Latinx leader, finding the one queer leader, finding the one native leader, and then placing at their feet or on their shoulders, more importantly, the entire burden 
of, of needing to change an institutional culture without resources, without authority, and without power. Uh, and people get frustrated. Pe what, like the, um, the frustration in that experience is so real. And I think that that, that approach is a deeply technical approach to a very adaptive problem that, that requires people to, to be more introspective, to understand American history in, in the ways we were never taught to understand American history, to take responsibility. Um, and those are the hardest things, right? Like to, to move away. I'll speak for myself. When I, um, when I got this job and the announcement was made, I had a number of Latinx leaders reach out to me. And the first, and the first couple of things they said was, we're so happy it's you, that it's a Latina and not a black person because black people are taking over foundations. And my, it was like the first time it happened, I was like, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a, that is definitely not the problem. But it, it like shook me. Um, so by the next time it happened, I needed to be prepared to have the hard conversation. Mm of like, what, um, what is your expectation of me as a Latina leader? Because I am surrendering to the need for black people to be the core beneficiaries of anything we do as an institution and not at the expense of Latinx people, but because I understand that when black people are liberated in this country, we're all liberated in this country. And the second time I was prepared with that and then, and then the shock like fell back on them. And so, I think that there's a way in which we've confused the, the need to address white supremacy as a culture, practice, power um, through, through representation, through like DEI efforts. I, it's so much deeper, so much more complex and mm. requires so much work. The things that are most exciting to me in this moment is that, um, during an economic crisis, during a pandemic, uh, during a climate crisis, the greatest animating force for organizing people has been racial justice. That racial justice, more than any of these things, has um, motivated people who have never protested to protest, has asked and invited people to ask questions about their complicity and their comfort in ways that in my lifetime and probably in my parents' lifetime had not happened. Um, we are seeing in a context of so much uncertainty, mm. um, a real alignment. And if we're able to uh, assume the opportunity of this alignment, seeing racial justice as the driving force for a, a fair democracy and democratizing leadership, as opposed to the other way around. I think we start with this idea that we need like a fair democracy and to democratize leadership and right. lead to racial justice. And right now we have so much evidence that if we start with racial justice, we will get to a truly democratic yeah. form of leadership. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, at the core of racism, I, I believe is, is dehumanization. You know, the, the sense that there are throwaway people. There are people who, who are other. And that same mindset, that same um, bias gets then cast on everything. You mentioned climate change, climate justice. Another issue where you know, we can, I don't know, maybe dehumanize is not the right word, but other nature and not see mm -hmm. that what happens out there, what happens to the Pantanal that's burning right now yeah. in Brazil or the Amazon, that's also happening to us, not in a metaphoric way, no, but, liter literally. but literally. And, you know, and, and if any of us is oppressed, we all are. I, I think it's, um, and, and that's why I get so excited too about this conversation around leadership. I actually believe that the, um, that the, the real change that's going to happen in our systems and our society and our institutions, that leadership is going to come from the extreme margins, what's currently marginalized. I'm talking about, you know, ex-convicts, prisons, prisoners, you know, people who have, for whatever reason, had to be outside of what's considered normal. And uh, there's no, as my friend Vimal said in India, there's no shortage of people, right? So resources are key, but the people power piece, and I know in your previous job, you were doing a lot around that. Can you say a little bit more about how you think about and maybe struggle, I don't know yet, but the struggle with this question of, okay, 
when you have resources and the foundation has resources, uh, there are the usual ways those resources tend to want to be expended. You know, people want grants and programs, and that's all really important. Uh, but we've all seen uh, replicated in grant making some of these same you know, issues of power privilege, despite even good intentions. And I just wonder, how do you balance that as a, as a grant maker now? The the need to you know put money and resources out there, but also this recognition that at the end of the day, when the money goes away, it's the people who will have changed their relationship with each other, the change within themselves, and ultimately the change you know more broadly. So how do you kind of balance or how do you think about that dynamic between power, resources, and 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 people? Yeah. Can I tell you, can I say something before, Eric, before I answer this question? Kibo put this in the chat, and I think it's an important distinction between ex-convicts and, ex and uh, folks who are previously incarcerated. I think that um, people who experiences, whose experiences are like indelibly marked by the failure of our institutions, that mark stays with them. And I think ex-convict is an expression mm. of that, whereas previously incarcerated people is that they had, there was a moment in time where they were incarcerated and they are no longer. Yeah, so thank Kibo, you. Thank you. Thanks, Kibo. Yeah, thanks, for, Kibo. Yeah. Um, really noted. Yeah, thank you. You know, philanthropy is such a weird space, right? Like, it's my job, essentially, to um, create a strategy and a vision for putting resources out in the world that uh, will be the fuel for freedom. Um, <laughs> that's what I am working towards at Marguerite Casey Foundation, what our team is working towards. Um, the first set of things that we we've done is essentially take away anything within the institution that makes us the arbiter of freedom uh, as opposed to handing people resources to get free. And so like process, you know, there's a lot of uh, the bureaucratic process in philanthropy, the lack of transparency and accountability, the um, inability to have hard conversations. Like we are picking winners. We're choosing, we have you know, as we as an institution, almost $50 million a year that we put out, um, of those $50 million, that's, you know, we are choosing people that we believe will uh, be the driving force for the freedom we want for the families and communities and people at the center of our mission. And, and philanthropy often steers away from that, and we are stepping squarely right into that, because I think um, knowing and understanding what's informing decisions helps, as somebody who was once a grant recipient, helps you understand what you're spending your time on, helps you not waste your time on a, a long application. I mean, the simplest thing we did was cut our application from, what was this, like 60 questions to 12 questions, knowing that by the time we got there, we were, we were likely to give an organization resources, a leader mm. resources, ending any reporting practice, right? Like uh, making relationship building and putting the burden on our staff to actually build a relationship of trust and accountability and transparency, uh, as opposed to having somebody write a report that's gonna go and die on a shelf, but that acts as like a, an external check, <laughs> you know, an external check that is so arbitrary. Mm -hmm. So as I think about it, I am, uh, we as a team are actively looking at the ways in which we can reshift the focus or, um, yeah, shift the focus away from foundations and philanthropic leaders being the, the audience towards having communities, people, and families be the audience of the leaders and the change we want to see. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's amazing. And it's, um, again, it's another example of leadership, I think. Not, not just what you said, but also how you are communicating this as I pick up from LinkedIn, uh, mostly watching your, you know, your, your communications there, but you're really challenging your foundation peers, uh, other CEOs, presidents of foundations. I've seen quite a few exchanges and you really calling people to task, it seems, because everyone, you know, can, not everyone, but many people espouse these principles. They espouse, you know, more grantee inclusion as it often gets talked about uh, and centering the people who they serve. And yet the reality is often not the case. And rather than letting people off the hook for that, I've seen you in quite a few instances uh, call it out. And, and that's, again, that's one of those moments where it's easy to hide behind the power of the privilege and say, well, we're doing, we're getting better. But it seems like even in this new role, and, and, I, and I say this, I think it's important, uh, Carmen, because uh, the way we think about leadership, 
and one definition that I have that is probably my favorite definition at the moment. It's about disappointing your own people at a tolerable pace or disrupting yeah. your own people at a tolerable pace. Because when you start to challenge those norms, uh, I, I, I'm just curious, how do people respond? I'm, maybe you get a mixture of response from people, but um, oh. yeah. It's, um, so I, one of the things that I think is difficult about the nonprofit sector generally is that we're really comfortable about, this is just, the nonprofit sector is a, um, uh, an example that I think is a societal experience. We're really comfortable talking about the victims, right? Like we are comfortable talking about poor people. We're comfortable talking about people who've been marginalized. We are comfortable talking about people who have lost in our economy and our democracy. And we're deeply uncomfortable talking about the victors, the people who gain every day. Like yeah. the richest people in this country have gotten exponentially rich, richer during a pandemic. They are the victors in this moment. And so um, I think when we only talk about the victims without mm -hmm. talking about the victors, it's easy for um, the victims to hold the blame close to their chest as a decision that they've made that has a, made their life possible, right? right. That, um, I think when I was running Workers Lab, we did an experiment, like a cash transfer experiment, where we're getting people emergency money. At that point, it was like, uh, almost more than 50% of Americans didn't have a thousand dollars in the case of an, an unexpected expense. And we all have unexpected expense and many of us have credit cards or people to call on, but half of us don't. And so we did this experiment and afterwards we reached out to people who got this money. And Eric, the thing that um, still sticks with me to this day is that in these interviews, people could point to the one decision that made their, um, their condition of being working poor inevitable. They dropped out of high school, had a kid too young, had to take care of a parent. It was one thing that happened in their life that subjected their, the rest of their life to be on the margins. And that's just not true and not fair. People right. are gaining from that condition. And right. I think it's important to be able to call both sides off. Because mm. I think it creates like a little bit of lift yeah. from the crazy making of that one decision. Yeah. I think it creates a lot of um, visibility into a system that has been obscured to many of us. Uh, and so it's been, you know, it's hit or miss. You know, I, um, I'm trying to be as thoughtful as possible. It, and uh, I see this job as a real gift, a real gift to actually even the playing field out in the fight for justice. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to I'm going to treat it like a gift. You know, yeah. I'm going to fully <laughs> I'm going to fully take advantage of the joy that it brings. I'm going to truly hold to my heart the pain and the sorrow that it brings. But I'm going to use it. Yeah. Yeah, and that this that the example of people pointing to a, a moment and saying, gosh, that's where I went down. That's where I, that's where I, and, and the internalized oppression of that, again, is just so, so unfair. And, mm -hmm. and, and so part of this work of leadership, again, as I think about it, is the systemic piece. How do you see the system that creates what might have felt like in those moments, uh, no other choice? And, and again, that's a skill set. I think some people have that. Some people learn that. But it's one of those things that I try to teach, and, and it's not about an abstract system. It's about how we as individuals make choices every day that create this oppression or, or the change in it. And I, I had a very personal um, experience of this about, uh, about four or five years ago. I was running a leadership workshop for a group of um, early childhood professionals, professionals. It was a fellowship program. And you know, doing what I normally do, I've been doing this for many years. And um, I'd like to think I've gotten better since I, I met you first, Carmen. But in this particular day, um, within four hours of doing what I do, one of the participants uh, who was an African-American man said, um, I, I, I'm done, uh, I don't wanna listen to you anymore. Uh, and, and you know, of course, from our work together that that's not an unusual statement for people to make with the work we do because we're often challenging norms in a good way, but in this case, it was very different. Uh, he was saying, I, you know, you're, you're racist and I just, I don't wanna sit here and listen to you anymore. And I, you know, I was shocked, you know, which is a sign of my ignorance um, then and now. and it, you know, it, it, it started to, of course, you know, the, the first thing I, you know, the first reaction, which I didn't do, but want to say is, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm not that kind of person, all that kind of stuff that, you know, those reactions. And what began to occur to me over, 
what ended up being two days of dialogue actually. So to his credit, he stuck with it as did the group. And over two days of dialogue, it, it occurred to me that what I was feeling in that moment was an inauthenticity to myself. In other words, why can't I just be me? It was kind of the feeling, why, if you only knew me, right? That, that was kind of the rationale. And of course, that sense of not being seen, not being valid for who I am mirrors in so many ways what's happening to them. Yeah. But, but it was um, what, what the really, the aha for me was that this idea of power, power transfer, yeah, it's not about giving over power, I don't think. It's not about even necessarily empowering, but at least coming from a person who sits in the kind of the dominant culture, you know, heteropatriarchal culture, what it felt like for me in that moment was that my identity, the very notion of who I am as a person, couldn't just be decided by me. And up until that point in my life, I'd always been able to define my own identity. And here I was now having to have a relationship with this group who had you know, both positive and negative reactions to me. But in any case, I had to really be in dialogue and relationship to discover who I was becoming mm. with them. And that was really powerful because I, I realized at the time, well, at the time it felt like I just can't be authentic to who I am if you only knew me. But over time, it occurred to me that that was actually the giving over of power in a small way, at least in a conversational way. And so I, I bring that up because that's an example of what we talked about earlier on of this kind of technical adaptive distinction, which yeah. comes from the work of adaptive leadership from the, the Kennedy School at Harvard, as you know. And it's, you know, the technical solutions are often about, you know, programs, you know, finding the right people in, in certain ways. And that's all really important. But this deeper level of change, which can go to the core of who I am, my identity, but it could also be organizational change and team level change. That's more adaptive. It's harder. There's no, there's no expert really that can tell me how to do that. But there are people who can hold me in that place of discomfort and even make me feel uncomfortable like that man did. And that was a leadership moment of his, by the way. And so I hear in what you're describing, you know, you're creating this crucible or this holding place for people to feel safe enough to begin to explore these and other kinds of questions around their own work and their own choices and, and their own self limitations, perhaps as well. Is that, is that a fair statement? Or how do you, how no, do you kind of think about no, this work I of mobilizing think, others? Yeah, no, I, that's it. And then doing so in ways that people feel safe, right? Like I think what he did, um, the questions that he called on you to ask of yourself in that moment, um, leaders of color experience every five minutes, right? Like a questioning of intention, a questioning of purpose, a questioning um, of contradiction, right? Like um, I need to make money to take care of my family because I am the only one and I'm not fulfilled in my job and don't feel like I'm doing my best out in the world. Holding that contradiction tightly is something that I think a number of leaders of color yeah. experience. And so I think it's like a generous um, invitation that he had and that's the invitation, right? Like how do we, um, I, I, this is going to be a non sequitur, but I'm going to come back. Like, I think love is the beginning, right? Like it's the easiest thing to do is to like, um, fall in love with somebody to, to have a crush, to start to develop feelings, to, to like love somebody. The hard thing is, um, seeing somebody. The hard thing is trusting somebody. The hard thing is telling somebody that they hurt you. Mm. Uh, the hard mm. thing is asking for something and needing something from somebody. And so I think in our, in our relationships, we lead as if love is the destination and it's just the beginning. And uh, I want to create environments where my team not only feels loved, but they also feel safe. And they also feel like uh, when I am upset and I tell them that I'm upset, that it's not going to be a character judgment and it's not going to um, atrophy their ability to be in conflict with me. My, I, don't, I don't have all the answers and I'm clear about that, but of course I have preferences, <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I want to make sure that people have the room to say these things while... Um, while feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And I think many leaders like take the oxygen out of the room yeah. um, in their leadership. Well, I love that you brought up love. Um, I, I've recently come to understand love as an expanded sense of self, an expanded sense of who I am, that who I am doesn't end with kind of my physical body, but it includes you. It includes yeah. others. It includes my team. It includes uh, people who don't look like me or even, you know, nature to some extent. And that, yeah. for, for me, I think you're exactly right, that you know, coming from that place, you're going to behave in a way that will be healing, that will be 
um, generative. I kind of equate it to like, you know, maybe a counter example is if my, if my son, I have three kids here, uh, if my son was sick and, and I wasn't taking care of him and you, and you said to me, Eric, you know, um, you better take care of him. That's the right thing to do. And if you don't, he's not going to take care of you. And by the way, child protective services might come and take him away. And I was like, you know, Carmen, you're right. I should, I should take care of him. I will. Like if that's the place I'm coming from, I'm not going to probably treat him well, yeah. but I, tr I take care of him, not because I have to, but because it's an expanded sense of self. If he's sick, I'm sick. And so in the same way, we're talking about, you know, race and racial equity uh, and leadership. And yeah, I think that's, if, we're not, if we're not coming from that, that kind of place, where I, you know, I matter because you are. If we're not coming from that place, then any action is not necessarily bad, but it, it, it may encode the very problem that we're trying to solve. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I'm struggling with right now in my leadership journey, Eric, is this question. Like, I, um, I am so angry at the moment that we're in as a country that I can find myself walking to the line of wanting to hurt people. Or like mm. wanting people to be hurt, mm. you know, of like mm. uh, you, my humanity is always being called into question, my, my valor, my intellect. And most of the times I feel like I've been able to like matrix my way out of like these feelings. And my leadership challenge in this moment is feeling a depth of connection to an us, you know, like uh, not having Toni Morrison, um, somebody I love. Uh, the book just came out of interviews with her and um, in it she talks about how we are living in a moment where people can't have conflicting ideas without wanting the other person not to exist and I think that that is my that's my leadership challenge in this moment mm -hmm. I think it's many of our leadership challenge in this moment and it doesn't mean I think sometimes people hear that and are like oh I just have to accept what they say no, I just I don't have think to. It's that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's that. I think it's something else, something uh, with a greater sense of depth. But I, if I'm hearing you right, it is this thing. It's like understanding that uh, we have to tether ourselves to each other. That there is an us. That there is an us, and believing yeah. so much in an us that may disagree with me. Um, and um, yeah, it's a real, I'm in the, in the, in conversation about racial justice, racial equity, this has been a real, I feel like I'm at the apex and I'm like, mm, how am I, yeah. how am I noodling on this in ways that don't, uh, don't automatically mean I need people not to exist or yeah. to be harmed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, um, thank you for sharing that, Carmen. That's a very honest and raw place to be speaking from. And, you know, I, I do think, um, the anger, you know, it, it's so important. I think the anger often comes from grief, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and that sadness and it's a natural reaction to that grief. But I think also the feeling of the grief itself can be an important part of this process. In fact, um, you know, one of the things that I've come to learn through this work is as this old system kind of dies and it's dying it's it's been sick for a while by old system i mean you name it right heteropatriarchy you know the fossil fuel based system the philanthropy as we know it and it's, it, this is all dying to some extent um i mean part of the work is to create something new and you've been doing that and you, you'll continue to do that that kind of innovative piece and mobilizing others but the other part of that which we don't often talk so much about uh, is is the holding people through a period of loss and grief and hospicing that. Now, that's not everyone's work to do. I think in, in, in many ways, that's the work of people who sit as gatekeepers, as people who consider themselves white. Mm. But this is just, people are losing. They're losing their sense of identity. They're losing jobs. They're losing a lot of this stuff. And now it's saying, let's feel sorry for them, but just recognizing that, you know, holding people through that period of change can also be a way to create those allies yeah. over time. But we often get excited about the new stuff and don't spend enough time mourning the loss and the grief that comes yeah. with that. And when people resist the change, even if they buy it, you know, notionally in their heads, the, the, the resistance often comes from the resistance to loss, not, not the change per se. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, I think that that is, that's it. That's what's happening with white identity in this yeah. moment, right? Like that. Um, and there are people who have been victors in uh, narrating white loss as a material loss at, right. and at the expense or at the gain of people of color. 
There mm. are people who have, um, uh, yeah, there are people who are winning. Um, and I, the thing that's difficult for me in this moment is this feels like um, an adaptive challenge times three, right? Because it, um, yeah. uh, it's about who I am. It's about my mom, you know, being an immigrant, yeah. things that she dreamed of. It's about my dad uh, being a kid on an island, selling fish and wanting so much more for himself. Uh, and um, a belief that their gain came at somebody else's expense is so hard to shift. Yeah. It's like so hard to have uh, positive feelings or like uh, hold the complexity. Yeah. That's not even positive feelings to hold the complexity mm -hmm. when it feels deeply personal uh, because it is personal. It is who I am. And it, it is, is yeah. to white people because it is who they are. Yeah, and yeah. Um, the thing that is often, I think, left out of these conversations is who has the power, right? Like at the end of the day, there are some voices that are um, more, have more power, have more weight than, than others. And I, um, yeah, I want to be really sensitive to that, like holding technical and adaptive in a context of power and resource, which yeah. I think um, in and of itself, it's a helpful individual tool, but in the context of who has power, it lends itself to a greater complexity um, and uh, invites us to be more patient, more calm, more loving, more more like self-referential, self self-caring self uh, than we otherwise might, might be. So, so Carmen, speaking of complexity, we have a question in the, in the Q&A, which I think is really good. And I know we wanted to talk about this too. And um, so I'm going to read the question and maybe we can answer this from that, that technical adaptive perspective. And I, we've been using this language. So very briefly for folks who are listening in and hearing this for the first time, a technical problem is one that has an answer. Um, you know, a broken arm, for example, it's a clear problem. You don't need to talk about it. You need to mobilize people. You don't need to love anyone necessarily. You just fix it. You know, find an expert who fixes broken arms. Uh, an adaptive problem is very different. There, there maybe is a, um, a problem that's clear, but the solution is unknown. Or maybe people even debate whether there is a problem. And this example of race that you were just giving, the complexity piece, part of that complexity, Carmen, is that people, uh, they disagree about the problem oftentimes, and much more the solution. And so these adaptive problems are everywhere. And one of the biggest mistakes and wastes of time and resource in organizational life and our personal lives is putting a technical fix on an adaptive problem. And then it comes back and we try again, you know, with another committee, another blue ribbon panel, another grant perhaps. So this question is in the, in the Q and A, if we can maybe take that lens. So, okay. Yeah, you know, this is great. So as a comms person, how do I give feedback to my CEO regarding these issues when they crop up? Um, your CEO, Carmen, what do you, and this is not a, a, you know, a comment on your comms person necessarily, but what do you, what do you wish comms people would do that might help you communicate this and help the organization to communicate this kind of thing more effectively? Uh, I, you know, I come back to this place of curiosity and asking questions. Uh, we actually recently, um, there's, there's a likely Supreme Court nomination <laughs> happening and we were like, thinking about what our position, like what our thinking about this is. And I was like, I got to Like, we have to make a statement. We have to get out the gate. We have to do this. And our vice president of comms called me and was like, so tell me more. Like, what, what are you really trying to do? And it ended up that I just had a whole bunch of personal, <laughs> that I had a bunch of feelings that I wanted the world to know. And he was like, how about you just tell me your feelings <laughs> um, and we'll wait for the more strategic opportunity. I think that when you ask people questions, uh, I think this is something that I learned from you, Eric, about the five whys, right? Like um, <laughs> you I keep asking people why you start to get to the, to the place of not only understanding, but more importantly for leaders, for them to be able to articulate the true reason and motivation why they why they believe something needs to happen yeah. and i find that um leaders are often told that they know everything and so when you uh, when somebody is like actually you don't know everything let me tell you the better way you're you're creating a two-lane road when you can have 
like a multi-lane highway, right? Mm -hmm. And that multi-lane highway for me is created by inquiry. It's created by questions. And why is like the most magnificent question, I think, right? Like to understand um, what people are afraid of, what people are trying to solve, who people are trying to speak to. Uh, and I think that sometimes in, in the comms position, um, it's seen as so like we need to produce things that we leave the question of why off the table. Uh, and I, I wish more leaders in philanthropy across the sector um, would have teams like my team, like Lee, mm -hmm. who was like, tell me why, but tell me why again. Yeah. Hold on, is that really why? Why? And I think that we, yeah, we leave that table, that question off the table, often at the expense of the organization. Yeah, the clarity of intention. It's um, and I'm, I'm often found saying that there is no such thing as a communications problem, which doesn't make my oh. comms friends happy. But it's it's a it's a hearing problem, or That's you right. know, and so. But the, the the technical approach is often let me tell you again, but louder. It's kind of yeah. like I used to live in Japan, and you know, people we couldn't speak together, but if we spoke louder and slower, we thought we'd solve the communications yeah. problem. We had to find a different way of showing up, you know, yeah. using our hands for gestures, making jokes, going out. So yeah, it's I think comms problems often get cast as technical when in fact they're quite adaptive and that example you gave is an example of a different approach that doesn't rely on your comms expertise alone it requires them being present asking good questions and getting to the root of you know what it is your intention is for communications there's another question here at carmen we have a little bit of, i think two three more minutes left so from stephanie about if you don't have relational if you have relational power not positional power how do you influence and not get killed and, and we know you know leadership i there's no place in leadership in my mind for um for martyrdom. Maybe in other parts of life, martyrdom has, serves a role, but in leadership, if you get taken out, you really can't be so helpful to people. And so this question of how do you kind of dance on the edge of what you're authorized and expected to do, but not so far that you become marginalized or, or killed off. Do you have any thoughts on that? And I'm sure no, many experiences dancing on that edge yourself. I mean, this is like the, the question you're asking is the question that I asked was asking myself in the moment that I met Eric, um, where, um, I had a bunch of relationships. I had uh, I had a level of credibility that other people in the institution didn't have. Um, and uh, I didn't want, this is where like the idea of martyrdom is difficult for me. Um, I saw it as a, vic leaving was a victory for me. You know, uh, it wasn't, I didn't feel like I had to sacrifice myself uh, to an institution and lend credibility to something I didn't believe in, but it was really about the timing. Um, I needed that, I needed that job to get the next job. And that's how I saw it. And uh, I think oftentimes martyrdom might be like, oh, you have to keep your job, might sound like or might land like, you have to keep your job forever and ever and just figure out how it works for you and not lose it. I don't think that that's the case. I think that every job that people have is just like a, a preparation for the next job you're gonna get. And so how do you ask yourself that? For me, I just kept asking myself that question. Like, how is this helping me in the next job that I'm gonna have? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit too soon to talk about your next job, I, I suspect, Carmen. Oh yeah, right. Given oh, my God. first 100 days. So. Is that right? <laughs> That's the uh, last, I think, Monday was my oh. day 100. <laughs> oh, congratulations on your 100-day anniversary. I'm very excited to see where this takes you as well as where you take the foundation and the field as a whole. I, I can't imagine a, a better place and a better person uh, to, be, to be doing what you're doing and, um, and knowing that you're, you're empowering and enabling others to lead with you. Because one thing we know from just from the conversation we're just having here, too, that you can never lead alone. Uh, it, it's impossible to, to lead alone. And yet, by holding people on high, uh, like those phone calls you were getting, oftentimes the result is we take on the burden, the responsibility for doing it all. And that's another way the systems crush us because we, yeah. we can't do that. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, I don't, don't want to leave on a crushing us note here. So is there any other final closing thoughts as we wrap up here, Carmen, you want to share with no, folks? Like I, am, um, I don't think that that was a crushing thought. Like I think that this is, we're having honest conversation about where we're at. And uh, if you live in this country and you are thinking about how to narrate the current moment, your work, our democracy, our economy, our institutions, um, 
we aren't in a great place. And I think that there's crazy making to try to find, um, uh, to try to like narrate it or justify it. I think we can find like the fireflies to tether together in a jar, to bring together in a jar and create a, a lamp. And um, I think it's important that we're just honest that this, we are in the hardest moment that we will probably ever live in. And it's probably going to be hard for a little bit longer. And we're not alone in that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Carl. It's great catching up with you as always. Good I hope this is helpful for folks. And I, I, hope, saying. I hope people Have here can, uh, can really step into their own leadership moments uh, and let us know both the successes and the failures. Thank you. Take care, all. Bye.